It's always nice for us to be able to do a service together. The service is morning prayer, which is in the Maroon Colored Prayer Book. And just um, for clarification, when I was when Judy was coming in, she said, I'm really looking forward to getting a lot of your dialogue this morning because we've heard it before. No, you haven't. It's a new one. <laughs> Our opening hymn is number 604, 604. of the prayer book. Dearly beloved brethren, the scripture moveth us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and the wickedness, and that we should not assemble, quote them, before the face of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, but confess them with a humble, lowly, penitent, and obedient heart, to the end that we may obtain forgiveness of the same by His infinite goodness and mercy. And although we ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before God, yet ought we most chiefly so to do when we assemble and meet together to render thanks for the great benefit that we received at his hand, to set forth his most worthy prayers, to hear his most holy word, and to ask those things which are requisite and necessary as well for the body as the soul. Wherefore I pray and beseech you as many as are here present to accompany me with a pure heart and a humble voice 
under the throne of the heavenly grace. Almighty and most merciful God, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have fallen too much to the vices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have not done none those things that we ought to have done. And we have done those things that we ought not to have done. And there is no help there. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of his holy name. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather he may turn from his wickedness and live, hath given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and announce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardoned the resolve with all them that truly repent and then and in giving his holy gospel. Wherefore we beseech him to grant us true repentance, his holy spirit that those things may please him which we do at this present, that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and unholy, so at the last we may come to his eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. For thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, open thou our lips. And thou shalt support thy grace. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make speed. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. Pray ye the Lord.
Jeremiah's treaty, it's in the second book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 27 to 34. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and the seed of beast. And it shall come to pass that as I have watched over them pluck up and break down, to overthrow, destroy, and bring evil, so I will watch over them to build and to plant, says the Lord. In those days they shall no longer say, the fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. But every man shall die for his own sin. Each man who eats sour grapes, his teeth shall be set on edge. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I married them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each man teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive all that is past, and I will remember their sin no more. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The song this morning is number 119, part 13. You'll find it on page 491. 491. Psalm 119, part 13. And we'll do this psalm responsibly by the half verse. Lord, what love have I unto thy law? All the day long is my study in it. Thy commandment maketh me wiser than mine enemies. For it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers. But I have plenty of my study. I have more discernment than the aged. Because I keep thy precepts. I have re refrained my feet from every evil way. That I may keep thy word. I have not shrunk from thy judgments. For thou teachest me. Oh, how sweet are thy words unto my throat. Yea, sweeter than honey unto my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding. And therefore I hate all evil ways. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world of thy end. Amen. This week's epistle is from the second letter of Paul to Timothy. Chapter 3. <sighs> if you could be a little less loud, I feel like I should whisper. This week's epistle is from the second letter of Paul to Timothy, chapter 3, verse 14, to chapter 4, verse 5. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the quick and the dead, and by his being in his kingdom, preach the word. Be urgent both in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, and exhort. Be unfailing in your patience and in your teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own liking, and will turn away from listening to the truth, and wander into myths. As for you, always be steady, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Word of the Lord. Thank you. Let us stand and join together in saying the Deum begins on the bottom of page 7 of our prayer. We praise you, O God, 
with knowledge of thee, we the Lord. All the earth does worship thee, the Father everlasting. To thee, O angels, cry out, the heavens and all the powers of earth. To thee, cherubim, seraphim, and images cry, Holy, 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 the Lord God of hosts. Heaven and earth are full of the majesty of thy glory. The glorious company of the apostles praise thee. The good and fellowship of the prophet praise thee. The noble army of martyrs praise thee. The holy church showed all the world but the acknowledge thee. The Father and into the majesty, thy honorable, true, and the only Son. Also the Holy Ghost comfort. Thou art the King of glory, O Christ. Thou art the everlasting Son of the Father. When thou didst spawn the age of the river man, thou didst not a poor virgin bloom. When thou hast overcome the sharpness of death, thou hast opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Thou sittest at the right hand of God, in the glory of the Father. We believe that thou shalt come to be our judge. We therefore pray thee, help thy servants, whom thou hast redeemed with thy precious blood. Make them to be numbered with thy saints in the glory of our lives. O Lord, save thy people and bless thy heritage. Govern them and lift them up forever. Day by day we magnify thee, and we worship thy name in every world without end. But save, O Lord, to keep us this day without sin. O Lord, have mercy upon us, have mercy upon us. O Lord, let thy mercy lighten upon us, as our trust is in thee. O Lord, in thee have I trusted. Let me never be confounded. Please be seated for the third reading. third reading is from the Gospel according to St. Luke, the 18th chapter, um, beginning at the first verse. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had any respect for people. In that city, there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, Grant me justice against my opponent. For a while, he refused. But later he said to himself, Though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice, so that she may not wear me out with her continual coming. The Lord said, listen to what the just unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? The word of the Lord. Let us stand and join together in the saying of the Benedictus, beginning on page 9. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people, and has raised up a mighty salvation for us in the house of the servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. 
that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hands of all the people. Perform the mercy promised to our forefathers and remember this holy covenant. To perform the oath of peace, swear to our forefather Abraham that he would for us, that we may be delivered out of the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people, for the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, and now, and it shall be, world without end. Amen. Let us join together in affirming our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. Amen. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us. O Lord, save the king. And do thy ministers with righteousness. O Lord, save thy people. And bless our inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord. And evermore mercy and O God, may clean our hearts within us. And take not thy holy spirit from us. And now I'm going to have hymn number 600. This is my father's world, 600 in a small blue book.
was not a serious question. <laughs> As Suzanne mentioned earlier, uh, this is a different comedy from the last one. Uh, hopefully, things working well, you can hear this one. Uh, it is still from the same book. It's from Peter Creed's Yes or No, Straight Answers to Tough Questions about Christianity. And they are all these things are set up as dialogues between two people. So it worked out very well that then we have a already made script for us. Now, being a clergyman, uh, we kind of adapted a bit. Hi, Father Dave. I hope you're ready because today is the day you promised to answer my big question. All your questions are big to me, Sue. I take them seriously. Thanks for that. You know, I don't think we could have really good conversations if you weren't a good listener as well as a good talker. I'm listening now. What's the question? I'm really struggling and I'm wondering, can you prove to me that there's a God? This isn't just a game, is it? No. I'm feeling uncertain about what to believe, and I want to know. What do you know? Why do you ask that? So we can start from there. Well, I don't know whether God exists, but I do know that the world exists. And I don't know if religion is true, but I do know that science is true. Fine. Now we have a starting point. But how can you bring me from science to God? There's no scientific proof that there's a God, is there? Uh, this way. Without God, there could be no science. What? How do you figure that? If there were no universe for science to know, there could be no science, right? Right. And if there were no God to create the universe, there could be no universe. Therefore, if there were no God, there could be no science. I see your argument, but I'm not sure I agree. I'm free to disagree, right? Yes, and I'm free to ask you why you disagree. I gave you my reasons. Now give me yours. Fair enough. Well, I'm not sure I believe that God created the universe. Who did that? Isn't it? <laughs> no. <laughs> Nobody created it. It was always here. You say God always was, right? Right. So why can't I say the universe always was? Um, fair question. Do you have a fair answer? I think so. I think if you look at this universe, you'll find good evidence for a God who made it. Where? I haven't been able to find any. Maybe that's because you've been looking only with your eyes, not with your mind. What do you mean by that? Maybe you're not asking enough questions. Me? <laughs> I question everything. Then question the universe. Ask how it got there. If you do, you find at least five different clues that there actually is a God. There are many more arguments for God than just these five. These are all clues all over life that point to God. But these five are based on what you see in nature. Sounds solid and scientific so far. Were they invented by some modern scientist? No. <coughs> by a medieval philosopher, St. Thomas Aquinas. Oh. You sound disappointed. Well, the Middle Ages were pretty primitive. In technology, yes, but not in philosophy or theology. <coughs> their machines weren't very advanced, but their minds certainly were. Well, what are the five proofs then? The first one is called the argument from motion. If you see some dominoes in a long row falling down, 
you know that someone pushed at least the first one, right? Right. Why? How do you know that? Why couldn't they just move on themselves? Well, nothing moves itself. Right. And neither does the whole universe. Think of the universe as an enormous chain of dominoes all moving. Something outside the chain must have started the movement right in the beginning. Otherwise, it wouldn't move because nothing can move itself. Wait a minute. We do. We move ourselves. Our minds move our bodies, but our bodies don't move themselves. Ever see a corpse move itself? Of course not, because a corpse is just a body without a mind or a soul. So nothing moves itself. And the universe is always moving, changing, everything in one great process of change. Therefore, Therefore, there must be a first mover. But that doesn't mean it's God. What else could it be? Scientific laws? Laws are just descriptions of how things move. You need a real thing not just a law to move another real thing. Okay, but why can't it just be some material thing instead of God? The universe is made up entirely of material things. Part of it can't move all of it. A pendulum swinging on a clock can't move the whole clock. Someone else has to come along and move it. And the whole universe needs a mover outside of it, something more than the universe, something supernatural. Hmm. This supernatural something is pretty vague, though. And God is supposed to be much more than that, isn't he? Certainly. This argument only proves that there is some supernatural cause behind the changes to the universe. I know who he is from other sources the Bible and Jesus, but it's the same God. There's only one. Okay, that's pretty convincing. What about your second proof? It's the argument from the very existence of things, not just their movement. You need a first cause of existence just as you need a first cause of motion, because nothing can make itself exist if it isn't already there. Nothing can cause itself. Okay, nothing can cause itself. Nobody can be his own parents. How does that prove that God exists, though? If there is no God who exists eternally, how can existence begin? And if there's no God who has existence by his own nature and doesn't get it from any cause, how can the gift of existence be passed down the chain of creatures who share it with each other? What? I don't understand. Share it? Yes. Creatures get life from their parents, right? Right. Parents are alive and they share that life with their young. Think about it this way. If nobody has a certain book, they can't share it, can they? If nobody has the authority to give a soldier a weekend pass, how can he ever get it? You can't share what you don't have. So somebody must actually have existence in the first place, and then it can be shared. Okay, but why couldn't this being that always has existence be part of the universe? Why does it have to be God outside of the universe, outside of space? Outside of time, too. He has to be eternal, to be uncaused, to have no beginning. Why? Kids ask, if God made everything, who made God? So what do you say to that? Why doesn't God make a cause? Because he's first. If nobody's first, nobody can be second, or third, or fourth. But things in the universe are second and third and fourth and fifteen billion. Therefore, there is a first. Okay, 
But like before, your argument doesn't tell much about God, just about something that's first. It tells us that it exists eternally without beginning, and that it causes the existence of everything else. That's something at least that not to bother an atheist, don't you think? <laughs> sure is. Okay, what about the third argument? It's from observing that everything dies or ceases to exist. Now, if there were no God who never died, who never stopped existing, then eventually everything would die and nothing could begin again. And then there would be nothing at all. But that's absurd. There is something. Maybe there just hasn't been enough time yet for everything to die. I guess that would mean the stars would have to die, wouldn't they? Yes, they would. Think about this. If there's no God, no creator, then there's no beginning universe. Right. The universe always was. Well, always is enough time for everything. If the universe had no birthday, then there's been an infinity of time already. Enough time for everything that could possibly happen to happen, including the possibility of universal death, universal destruction. So then, how come we're still here? The universe is only about 15 billion years old, though. The scientists say the Big Bang happened then, 15 billion years ago. And here's another piece of evidence for you. As there's no God, then the universe always was. And science itself says the universe came into being only 15 billion years ago. That's a different argument, though. But the point is this. Aquinas' third proof is that without an eternal God, everything would eventually cease to be and not be able to create it Zero. Forever. Won't that happen anyway, though? The second law of thermodynamics says that all energy gets dissipated, wears down. Even the galaxies get cold, like great big coffee cups. Don't ask me how I know that. The point is, why hasn't it happened already? If the universe is all there is and always has been there. I don't know. Fourth proof, please. The fourth one is an easy one. In the universe, some things are better than others, right? Right. So there must be a best, a standard of goodness by which to judge all the relative betters. One thing is closer to the best than another. And this standard has to be absolute goodness. Why? Everything is relative. There's no absolute. Absolutely. Oops. Another congregation. Another congregation. No, another contradiction. But everything is relative, though. To what? Not to any absolute. Nothing is unchanging. Relative to each other. To everything else. There's just perpetual progress. Progress towards a goal. If the goal or standard moves to then how can you ever make progress for it? How can you steal a second base that's moving? Progress implies an absolute, unchanging goal for a standard. So this argument says that if one thing is better than another, there has to be a God? An absolute good, yes. And that's God. Well, maybe one thing isn't really better than another. Maybe it's just our way of looking at things. You mean that maybe people aren't really better than cows? We just think they are? Maybe. But I like cows. Then why don't we eat people as well as cows? And why not preach hate as well as love? If goodness is only our prejudice, why pay any attention? You've got me there. I'm not that crazy. Of course, love is better than hate. I still like cows, though. Uh, let's not get off on a tangent. 
If love is better than hate, then there has to be a standard by which we judge goodness. And that standard is God. Okay, you convinced me again. What about the fifth one? It's the easiest of all. It's called the argument from design. Design proves the existence of a designer. And nature is full of design. Therefore, there must be a designer behind it all. Wait, what? Can you make that a little less abstract? Sure. Suppose you were shipwrecked on a desert island and you found a message written on the sand in English. Did you think it was written by chance, by the wind? Of course not. Or if you found a house there, did you think it just evolved by chance? No, it would mean that there had to be somebody on the island. Right. Well, the universe is more design in it than a house. How could it happen? Yep, by chance. You know, there are two scientists talking to each other as the first moon rocket took off back in the 60s. One was a believer, the other was an atheist. The believer said, isn't it wonderful that our rocket is going to hit the moon by chance? The atheist why? What do you mean by chance? We put billions of hours of planning into that rock. So the believer said, well, if you don't explain the rock by chance, why do you explain the universe by chance? It's much more complicated than our rock. We can design a rock, but we can't design a universe. Later, the two scientists were walking past an antique store and the atheist, who was an art collector, saw a painting in the window that attracted him. Who painted that? He asked. Nobody, said the believer. It happened by chance. <laughs> okay. It doesn't sound likely, but I think it could have happened by chance, you know. I once heard somebody say that if you put a million monkeys at a million typewriters for a million years, they'll eventually type out Hamlet by chance. Maybe so. But if you found a copy of Hamlet, you wouldn't believe monkeys had it by it, made it by chance, would you? No. It might be possible. It is very improbable. Then why do you use different standards of explanation when it's a question of God? You wouldn't accept the by chance explanation for Hamlet or the rocket or the picture or the house on the desert island. The only reason you say the whole universe might exist purely by chance is to avoid admitting that God exists and he created it. Hang on. I think you might be right. Good. Here's another thing. Would you trust a computer that had been programmed by chance, by a fall of hailstones on a keyboard, for instance? No. Or if you're flying in an airplane, and the public address system announced that the plane was being flown by a computer that had been programmed by a cat walking back and forth across the keyboard. Should you trust the plane to land you safely? Well, it sort of sounds like what happens at my house, but no way. <laughs> then, why do you trust your brain and nervous system? It's like a very complex computer. It's been programmed only by chance. If it's been programmed only by chance, not by God, not by any designer, why do you trust it when it does science and when it tells you about nature or about itself? If you can't trust the programmer of the human brain, then you can't trust the brain when it tells you about the brain. Okay, Father Dave, they're good arguments. But as I told you, I can't base my life on an argument. And as I told you, I don't do that either. But they're strong clues, at least. Signs. 
evidence all point to God. I have to admit that much, if I'm honest. I still don't feel confident that God exists, though. You will. Honesty is the beginning of the love of God. Why do you say that? Because honesty comes from the love of truth, and God is truth. God is love, too. So I guess that clinches it. So just to sum up, the five proofs of God are, number one, the argument of motion. That if you see something moving, you know that something must have moved it in the first place. Number two, the argument of first cause. That if something started, then someone had to start it. Number three, the argument that everything dies. There must be something that does not die. Otherwise, eventually, everything would be dead. Number four, the argument of absolute goodness, the perfect one to whom everything else is compared. And number five, the argument of design, that if something has been designed, then there must be a designer, and that designer is God? That's exactly right, so good job. You too, Father Dave. You've sorted out my uncertainty. Thanks so much. See you soon. We should have lunch, maybe. How about after church? Sounds great. However, before that, we have an important thing to do. Uh, that's to get on with praising the God that we have been talking about, which, if it really is the case, he doesn't exist. We're just wasting our time. The obituary hymn is 598, for the beauty of the earth.
through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to pick up now on the bottom of page 11. This is actually where we left off a few minutes ago. The bottom of page 11. This is the collect for peace. O God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, in knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom, defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in thy defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries. Through the mind of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Will you join with me, please, in the College for Grace? O Lord, our Heavenly Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this day, defend us in the same with thy mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings may be ordered by thy governance to do always that is righteous in thy sight. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, Amen. Please be seated for Emily's solo. page 13. Let us pray. This is a prayer for the clergy and people. Almighty and everlasting God, from whom cometh every good and perfect gift, send down upon our bishops and clergy and all congregations committed to their charge the helpful spirit of thy grace, and that they may truly please thee. Pour upon them the continual dew of thy blessing. Grant this, O Lord, for the honor of our Advocate and Mediator, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, as I usually do, I'm going to use a number of uh, occasional prayers, and I'll give you the page numbers so that you can follow with me, and I'll try to do some of them with me. I'm going to begin on page 44. Page 44, prayer number 9 for the parish. O God, the Holy Ghost, Sanctify of the faithful, sanctify this parish by thine abiding presence. Bless those who minister in holy things. Enlighten the minds of thy people more and more with the light of the everlasting gospel. Bring erring souls to the knowledge of God our Savior. And those who are walking in the way of life, keep steadfast unto the end. 
Give patience to the sick and afflicted, and renew them in body and soul. Guard from forgetfulness of thee those who are strong and prosperous. Increase in us thy manifold gifts of grace, and make us all to be fruitful in good works. O blessed Spirit, whom with the Father and the Son together we worship and glorify, one God, world without end. Amen. Now I'm going to flip over to page 57. <clears throat> this is the general intercession that we usually do together. Page 57, prayer number 45. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I'll ask you to pray with me, please, aloud. Be mindful, O Lord, of thy people bowed before thee, and of those who are absent through age, sickness, or infirmity. Care for the infants, guide the young, support the aged, encourage the faint-hearted, collect the scattered, and bring the wandering to thy fold. Travel with the voyagers, defend the widows, shield the orphans, deliver the captives, heal the sick. Suffer all who are in tribulation, necessity, or distress. All those that love us, and those that hate us, and those that have desired us, unworthy as we are, to pray for them. And those whom we have forgotten, do thou, O Lord, remember. For thou art the helper of the helpless, the savior of the lost, the refuge of the wanderer, the healer of the sick. Thou who knowest each man's need, and hast heard his prayer, grant unto each according to thy peaceful loving kindness and thy eternal love, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, as we know uh, from the email that I sent out earlier this week, we've had a loss in our congregation this week, and we're going to say a prayer for Anne now. This is on page 56. I'm go I'll do it myself. Almighty God, with whom do live the spirits of them that depart hence in the Lord, and with whom the souls of the faithful, after they are delivered from the burden of the flesh, are in joy and felicity. We praise and magnify thy holy name for Anne, Walshus, Ackroyd, and all thy servants who have finished their course in thy faith and fear. And we most humbly beseech thee that at the day of the general resurrection, we and all they who are of the mystical body of thy Son may be set on his right hand and hear that his most joyful voice, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. For the, from the foundation of the world. Grant this, O merciful Father, for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Amen. I'm going to flip back to page 14, pick up the service again. Page 14. The bottom of page 14. The general thanksgiving, and I'll ask you to say this with me, please. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, thy unworthy servants, do give thee the most humble and hearty thanks for all thy goodness and loving kindness to us and to all men. We bless thee for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for thy inestimable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we beseech thee, give us that deep sense of all thy mercies, that our hearts may be unfeignedly thankful, and that we show forth thy praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to thy service, and by walking before thee in holiness and righteousness all our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost we all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee, and has promised that when two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou wilt grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants as may be most expedient for them. Grant in us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Thank you.
together the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. Our final hymn is number 403, 403. 